Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Lakeland Hogan. I'm Home Instead Senior Care's gerontologist and caregiver advocate, and I'm joined by our good friend, David Troxel. Hi, David. How are you today? Hey, Lakeland. How are you? I'm well, thanks. So good to see your face virtually. I know we're all tuning in virtually in this kind of new day and age of social distancing, but I, I like connecting virtually. It's fun. We're hunkered down together, even though we're, I'm in California and you're in Omaha, we're, we're all doing great. Yes, yes. Uh, and we're curious, where is everyone else coming from? As David just mentioned, he's in California, I'm in Nebraska. Uh, you can chat to us in the, uh, the chat function uh, in Zoom. We'd love to hear where you're coming from. It's fun to hear. Uh, sometimes we have uh, people coming from all over the world. So it looks like we have someone from Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. Uh, Brittany from Indiana. Hello, everyone. We're so happy to have you. Julie from Texas. Uh, so this is this is a great crowd that we're bringing in here. Florida, British Columbia, Virginia, Alberta, Canada. So we're now an international chat. I love that. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. And and I know we're also going live on Facebook. So we have people here in Zoom with us. But if you're joining us on Facebook, hello to all of you. Give us a like, a uh, heart. Give us a heart. Uh, let us know where you're coming from, too. Uh, we're so excited to be here. Um, this is part of um, our COVID caregiving during COVID-19 series, but um, specific to dementia, we always have a monthly chat focused on dementia family caregiving. And so this is kind of acting as our, our chat for our, the month of April, uh, but also part of this bigger series. So um, we thank you so much for tuning in. Again, my name is Lakeland Hogan. I'm Home Instead Senior Care's gerontologist and caregiver advocate. Um, and we are live recording this, but just so you know, if you're joining us on Zoom, your lines are muted. So you don't have to worry about the dog barking or the mailman ringing the doorbell. We can't hear you on our end. Uh, we're also recording this. Um, and so we'll put it back out there on Facebook and on our website. We'll email you a link. Uh, so if you find it valuable, you can forward it on or reshare it. To whoever you would like. Um, and on this chat, we are taking live questions. So if you have a question, you can uh, on Zoom use the chat function or the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, hello, uh, we would love to take your questions in the comments section below this chat. Um, and we'll be getting to those questions towards the end uh, of our time together. And we also want to stay connected with you. So please feel free to sign up for our email list. We send out emails a couple times a month about uh, Alzheimer's and dementia care um, resources, the latest in research. Uh, it's a way for us to stay connected to you. So we'll put the link to sign up for that email uh, in the chat and on Facebook. Um, and then also like us on Facebook. We have a Remember for Alzheimer's Facebook page. We encourage you to give us a like and follow us. We post information about all of our chats and events there, as long, uh, along with some great information, tools, resources. So I mentioned earlier that I am joined by David Troxel. David, we're so glad to have you with Everybody, us. Everybody, happy to be here. Um, David is an internationally known expert in Alzheimer's disease and memory care. He's worked over 25 years in the Alzheimer's field, developing uh, and teaching care techniques as a consultant, writer, and speaker. He's co-authored the book, The Best Friends Approach to Alzheimer's Care, along with many other influential books and resources related to Alzheimer's care and training. Uh, if you wanna learn more about his book and his work, you can go to thebestfriendsapproach.com. And David is a really good friend of Home Instead Senior Care. Uh, we've enjoyed working with him over the years on our training and our resources and really just appreciate his expertise and wealth of knowledge and just his uh, general uh, warmth and, and love for the work that he does and um, all of um, the work we've done together. We're just so appreciative of that. And David, we're so excited to, to have this time together to talk with you today. <clears throat> Thank you, Lakeland. It's wonderful to be here, and I already see a few familiar friends uh, pop up on people who are listening to the webinar, and happy to be with you today. Wonderful. Well, we know, David, that the world, as, as we exist in the world today, we're really having to adjust to this whole notion of social distancing. Uh, it's really helped 
making us create new routines. Um, it's impacting family caregiving. We know that family caregivers are already faced with many <clears throat> challenges, uh, but right now they might have the addition of working from home. Uh, maybe they're homeschooling their kids right now as well. Uh, they might have trouble staying connected to their support system because we're not allowed to really gather together. Um, mm -hmm. And so during this time, I'm sure many caregivers out there are having lots of questions and they're having to navigate new challenges and issues related to COVID-19 and, and social distancing. Um, so David, I'm glad that you're here with us today to talk more about this because I, I do yeah. think it's, it's on a lot of people's minds. Um, and so I thought maybe first we could kind of just address some some general, um, you know, points or, or topics around this COVID-19 and around dementia care. Um, so I think a lot of people are wondering, and we've gotten this question in a lot on our various platforms, is does mm -hmm. having dementia put people at a higher risk of getting coronavirus or this COVID-19 virus? Well, to the best of our knowledge, Lake, on the answer is no. Uh, we don't think there's any particular link and a risk factor between Alzheimer's, the other dementias, and COVID-19. What is tough is, as a good friend of mine who's a geriatrician says, dementia doesn't travel alone. And many people with Alzheimer's or other dementia have other conditions, like you know everything from heart issues to um, depression to dehydration, things that are treatable, uh, pain that sometimes goes unrecognized. And so because the person with Alzheimer's may have other conditions, that may weaken their immune system, make them uh, much more fragile if they do get exposed to COVID-19, uh, which can lead to very poor outcomes. So I would say that <clears throat> people with dementia certainly are at greater risk for, um, for <clears throat> death and dying with this disease. Yeah, that's a good point, David, that many people or many people living with dementia have kind of comorbidities or other conditions that would put them at a higher risk. So uh, hopefully that helps to clarify that a little bit for family caregivers out there. And I know that, um, you know, I think what some family caregivers are a little concerned about, David, is, you know, um, their loved ones remembering the importance of, of hygiene right now. We yes. know that we're being told by the CDC to wash our hands with soap and water for 20 seconds and, and to use hand sanitizer when it's not available, you know, covering our nose and our mouth when we cough or sneeze, um, you know, keeping social distance, that might be challenging for an individual with dementia to understand and to remember. Uh, so are you hearing that from, from the individuals you're working with? Any thoughts there? Well, a couple of thoughts, like, and I think, I think, first of all, you know, many people with Alzheimer's, they kind of lose that start button, <clears throat> that ability to initiate tasks. <clears throat> By the way, sorry, I have managed to get an allergy attack this week, so I, I don't think I have any other illnesses, but the grass in California is growing. Um, so what we do know is that people with Alzheimer's, they need cueing. And so even without COVID-19, I think it's up to family and professional caregivers to encourage people to wash their hands, to practice good hygiene, to encourage, you know, many caregivers, you know, will take even a, a nice hot towel, put a little bit of soap on it or washcloth, maybe put in the microwave for a few minutes, almost like if you're on an, an upgraded airline, you get a nice little towel where they wipe your hand. So, you know, in some ways, the best healthcare practices that are hopefully happening all the time are still in place. But with yeah, dementia, yeah. you're absolutely right, Lake, when you can't say to somebody, mom, don't forget to wash your hands or yeah. your dad do this. You really have to cue them and be there for them as well. Uh, so, so there are certainly extra challenges. And I, and I just want to comment, Lakeland, as we, as we get going here, I know that many people tuning in are in-home caregivers. And I guess the, the good news is if you're living together, husband and wife, and your partner has dementia, you don't need to stay six feet apart if you've been together for the last three weeks, like many of us have in California. Uh, that being said, what a, what a challenge, because day centers are closed, uh, services are shut down, everything is much tougher. So uh, it, I will say that at least uh, as, as a care partner, if you've been living together, you may not have to keep that you know, social distancing if you've been together for the last month. But mm -hmm. nevertheless, I think your job has become a lot harder with the shutdown of services. Yes, absolutely. And, and I know that many family caregivers are, are facing that challenge. Um, and, and before we dive too much farther into this, David, uh, would you mind kind of reviewing some of the best practices out there for quality dementia care? I know we talk a lot about person-centered care. And even if you're at home with your loved one, uh, person-centered care is still so important. So will you remind us 
what those kind of principles are before we move forward in the conversation. Sure, Lakeland, and I really appreciate the question because, you know, in this time of crisis, I think it's actually even more important to remember some of the do's and don'ts of good dementia care. It, it's so important to uh, remember that right now our current medications are very modest in their impact. We, we don't really have a medicine that helps for dementia all that much. Um, in fact, as I'm sure many of you know, listening in or watching, it, it's been more than a decade since we've had a new FDA approved drug for Alzheimer's. So we are really hurting on the medical front. But in general, uh, what is the treatment for dementia? It's engagement, it's socialization, it's, it's, it's having empathy and understanding what your family member is going through. Uh, it's, it's communicating, it's listening to music, it's enjoying a walk together, uh, maybe in the backyard right now. But you want to create what I like to call a therapeutic environment, an environment that's healing. And, and how do we do that as a family member? Well, we, we tell their family, we tell our mom or dad or husband, wife, partner they're loved. We, we, we ask them questions. We reminisce. We, we uh, enjoy a good meal together. Uh, we, we really try hard to kind of give this emotional connection. I'm, I'm always moved by Maya Angelou's famous quote, which is so relevant to all of us these days, you know, that people, to paraphrase it, people will never remember what you said or did but they'll always remember how you made them feel. So I think helping someone with dementia feel engaged, feel important, feel loved, feel safe is very important. And we'll get to some more tips later in this conversation, but uh, certainly now is a good time if you're a family member stuck at home uh, to go to those Alzheimer's Association resources, you know, learn more about the do's and don'ts of caregiving, because particularly during this tough time when you can't necessarily get out and about or use services, you wanna do your best at home to create a, a loving, supportive environment that will not only reduce behavior, but I think help you get through this time uh, more successfully. Yes, I agree, David. And we are gonna share some more tips here in just a bit. I don't wanna jump the gun. <laughs> but I think that it's important to remember that you're right, right now, those principles are uh, probably more important than ever, really creating that safe environment. I know a lot of caregivers have said, do I let my mom watch the news right now? I don't know if she's understanding it and comprehending it and it's just creating unnecessary fear or a lot more questions. And, um, and so, you know, again, creating that safe environment is so important. And I think what's neat about this person-centered care approach is, you know, it, it has this fancy term and a lot of research behind it, but really family caregivers know their loved one the best. I um, mean, it's those clues and um, kind of things that they know about their loved one, their likes, their dislikes. That's really what person-centered care is and really tailoring every interaction and every moment um, to fit that individual. So I think that that's also important to remind family caregivers. You don't have to go out and, you know, memorize all of these tips and tricks. You can really just, again, use the person's life story or life history to connect with them and, and to create meaningful engagement or interactions. You're, you're completely right, Lakeland, and, and again, I know we're both so excited to get into our very specifics about COVID-19 caring, but, you know, one family member I talked to the other day, she's now doing a daily happy hour with her husband. It used to be just on Fridays, and I said, okay, well, be sure to drink the good wine right now. Don't say it for a rainy day, <laughs> but I think the idea of building ritual into your day, um, you know, have your own little schedule is very powerful. And, and Lake, and I, I do want to just tag one thing you just mentioned that is so critical. And, and I have to say, it, it reminds me very sadly of the 9-11 experience that we many of us lived through. I think on this call, most of us lived through. But I remember that many caregivers during the 9-11 crisis would have the TV on all the time. And it really caused challenges for people living with dementia. Because when you have Alzheimer's or one of the other dementias, you know, a little worry can grow into a big anxiety. And of course, they read your face if you're the husband, wife, you know, caregiver, and you're stressed. So as tough as it is, I, I do encourage, you know, now's the time not to have CNN or, you know, the news on 24-7, uh, yeah, be judicious, yeah. and, and, you know, have some, some positive things on, on television, you know, documentaries, nature shows, old fun movies, things that, uh, that, that really kind of evoke a different emotion. Yeah, that's a great point, David. I know I've, I've read up a lot on, on this, and I think it's good for everyone to take a break from the news. And, and some uh, outlets suggest, you know, maybe just checking it once in the morning and once in the afternoon or, you know, just twice a day and limit it to that, because otherwise you can get wrapped up in it. And, um, and you're right, if, if a 
caregiver is anxious or stressed, their loved one will be able to feel that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that they can feed off of each other's energy. And, and so uh, certainly something really important um, to remember. Um, and I know right now people are at home and they, they can't always um, get out and about to their different activities. So um, are there some, you know, things that you've seen or stories you've heard of people getting creative uh, and doing activities at home or uh, engaging in meaningful ways? Sure, and, and maybe I'll sort of target first some of the home ideas. There may be listeners or viewers who um, have people in other settings. But you know, I think, I think now's a really good time to uh, think about some ways of, of doing things with your family member to kind of engage with them. Maybe you're working at home now. Maybe you don't have as many uh, you know, reasons to go outside, so uh, unless it's absolutely essential, of course. So now might be the time, and I, and I start off with life story work. You know, it's very important for us to honor the memory and honor the life stories of people living with dementia. And particularly if your family member ends up having a caregiver come in or goes to assisted living uh, or even goes to the hospital, I love to have like a top 10 card, uh, Lakeland, where maybe it might be the top 10 things about my dad, you know, his interests, his, his hobbies, uh, his nickname, how he likes his morning coffee, his life achievements. You know, maybe he was the doctor of the year in Cook County or, or uh, the teacher of the year. And so I think this is a really sweet time to consider even writing a mini memoir of your family member, you know, going through and, and pulling out those scrapbooks and doing things like that. Uh, I think other things that are very purposeful and productive, you know, sorting, organizing, getting, tackling those boxes that all of us say we're gonna do right now <laughs> for ourselves, do it with your family member and have some fun. Good grief, mother, look at this purple and orange plaid coat. Whoever would have worn such a thing? You know, have, have some humor about the old fashioned things like that as well. So I think doing chores together, I think this is also a time, and I've always felt that people with Alzheimer's and dementia still have a need to be needed. And so mm -hmm. I love considering maybe doing a project, maybe baking cookies for the first responders, maybe uh, doing dog biscuits, one of my all time favorite activities for the local animal shelter. Um, you know, writing letters for appreciation, things like this. This is a great time for civic engagement and it makes us better and makes the person with dementia feel better as well. So, you know, me memoirs, things like that are very important. I love music and we'll talk more about that a little later in the call as well. But, you know, music in so many ways is the language of, of dementia. I'm a big fan of this man, Dr. Oliver Sacks, who I think died about two years ago. Uh, who wrote a lot about neurology and music in the brain. And music does uh, affect emotion and cues memory. And so now's a great time to give yourself a daily music hour, or, or certainly if your family member is in an assisted living home, make sure they have access to music in their room, not just in the, in the bigger room. We wanna get them, even if it's an old fashioned CD player that you have buried in the attic somewhere with some old CDs, you know, bring it in to your, your family member if they're in assisted living. So music. Uh, enjoying time together, projects, I think very, very powerful. All of these things, again, can be very, very helpful. And I mentioned it earlier, maybe developing a few little rituals, you know, have a That's little fair. afternoon tea party every day. Uh, I think, I think uh, learning, adult learning, you know, now there's so many cool things on the web. You, you know, maybe your mother lived in Paris and you might go and look at the Louvre Museum online, uh, take an adult education class together. Uh, have some fun. You say, hey, dad, I know you grew up in San Francisco. Let's, let's write down as many things as we can think of about San Francisco, maybe watching some YouTube videos. So there's a lot you can do to engage the person with dementia. And I'll just say one more thing that all of these things are good for the person with dementia, but I think they're good for us as well, because we're, we're being productive, we're being purposeful and thoughtful, affectionate, and, and maybe, maybe even working on some projects you need to do, but with your family member. And this is a great way, again, this idea of not only person-centered care, where you look at the person's needs and try to really understand and fill them, but even what I call relationship-centered care. In my own work, the best friends approach, being a best friend to a person with dementia, I think can be very powerful. Those are some great suggestions. And I, I love music. And I think music is something that, you know, no matter, I would probably all have a little bit of different taste in the type of music, mm -hmm. but it's, it's kind of the universal language, no matter uh, where you live or what language you speak or where you come from, music was likely a part of you at some point. 
So I think it's a beautiful way to come together. And, and I like how you mentioned, you know, looking up places online that you used to live and mm -hmm. uh, museums I know are offering uh, those mm -hmm. kind of uh, virtual tours. And I know Broadway mm -hmm. is offering some old musicals and the That's Metropolitan right. Opera is streaming yes. online. So there are lots of things out there online uh, that, that people are really tapping into. And it's, it's really mm -hmm. fun to see the way people are getting creative. Um, and, mm -hmm. and we even see this within our own caregivers that are out in the home with uh, older adults and working with people who are living with Alzheimer's and other types of dementia, still making sure that they get out and about to walk socially distanced in a safe way. Um, but you know, nature also right now can be uh, a great way to get some fresh air, a little bit of exercise. And you know, even if you can't get around the block, you can even just sit on the front porch or the back deck and um, just soak in a little sunshine and just kind of be outdoors. I think that for a lot of people right. is also a refreshing way um, to, to just- Lakeland, let me, let me I totally support that. And, and I'll kind of, again, cover a broad situation. If, if your family member is in assisted living or in skilled nursing, you know, most of those buildings have some kind of interior courtyard. And even though people are being so cautious about interactions these days, uh, I would absolutely call the building uh, ask if you could do even a telephone care conference, find out what's new with mom or dad and, and you know, really run through kind of how it's going. Uh, I would ask the building to be sure to get mom outside, you know, uh, during the day if at all possible. Because uh, again, being out of doors, I think is very therapeutic. It's sensory, it's spiritual, it uh, gives you natural vitamin D. And we know it fights depression and improves mood. So I think do that again for your family member if they're in a residential care setting. And if you're at home, by all means, sit on the front porch, uh, uh, I live in Sacramento, and I, I, my office is on the second floor of my house, and I can look out the street. I saw a lady with a walker the other day walking with her daughter, and, you know, again, six feet apart, but uh, it can be done, and I think that's very, very powerful. Get a nice straw hat, enjoy it together. Yes, I agree, um, especially as we're coming into spring. You know, the flowers are starting to bloom, at least here in Nebraska, so there is lots to see outside, um, and that, again, can be such, such a, a beautiful way to share mm -hmm. time together um, and get that much needed vitamin, vitamin D. Um, and David, I know I'm kind of switching gears just a little bit, but I know that um, caregivers have maybe a little bit of fear right now about um, you know, the health of their loved one, the health of themselves. Um, the, uh, there's a group called Us Against Alzheimer's and they actually put out a survey asking family caregivers and people living with dementia um, a few things about kind of this state of where we are today in society. And I was kind of shocked by some of the results. Um, and we'll post the link so if people want to mm. look more into this research. But it said nearly three quarters of those taking care of a person living with Alzheimer's or dementia was unsure what would happen to their loved one if they themselves, the caregiver, care partner, mm. were to get sick. And then about a third said they weren't sure what to do if their loved one got sick. So I know that's a real concern right now. So what are some things that you would suggest uh, family caregivers, care partners do um, right now to kind of prepare or to make a backup plan? What, the, what, what, a, what an important, important issue because you're right. There are actually studies that suggest that often the caregiver may even die before the person with dementia because sometimes it's the caregiver who has the enormous emotional, physical, financial stress uh, where the person with dementia might be more in the moment. So you're absolutely right that this is an important concept, Lakeland. Um, you know, I used to be for many years with the Alzheimer's Association, spent so many hours with families, and I would ask them that question often, what is your plan B? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if there's anything, I guess, to say about dementia, I don't know if i call it a positive, but it's slow, it's progressive. You do have time, most often, to make a game plan. And so I certainly encourage, you know, family members to use this time. You could do it virtually, get your powers of attorney or legal financial affairs in order, you know, make some plans, investigate resources. Um, don't wait and wait and wait to use services. You want to think about, you know, what if I fall down the stairs and break my ankle? Who's going to take care of my husband with dementia? And this is a great time to talk to your family, make some plans, you know, think about, you know, some options for in-home care or residential care. You may never need all those, but um, it, it is very important. And, and I'll also say one more thing, Lakeland, because I've actually talked to family members who are struggling right now because, again, 
they're doing all the work themselves. It's a, it's a depressing, challenging time to begin with. The day center is closed. You know, sometimes, you know, in-home staff or friends who've been helping even informally can't come. So uh, I, I think it is a good time to recognize that using services also provides socialization. You know, if you do it all by yourself with no help, nobody else is coming into the picture. And, and it really does help if you have a lively in-home caregiver, if you go to a, a really activity-rich day center, pick a provider of residential care that has a super good activity program, socialization is the treatment for dementia in so many ways. I like to say the brain that loves company. So using services is not an admission of failure. Don't feel guilty about it. It's actually a gift you're giving your family member because again, it connects them to the world. So yes, use this time to think, well, what if, and get those legal financial affairs in order, talk to family, talk to neighbors, friends, and, and, and you know, when we come out of this, and we will come out of this, mm -hmm. uh, you'll, you'll really be much more prepared, I think, as a caregiver. Yeah, David, I think that is such an important point. Um, I really like what you said about using services and how it's not um, a, a failure on the caregiver's part. I see it as a, a strength and a way for the caregiver even to get some respite so that they can continue uh, to be a caregiver. Respite is time away from the caregiving situation. So by hiring people to come into the home or you know, uh, taking your loved one to an adult day center or program, um, it really gives that caregiver opportunity to recharge and to continue to be the best caregiver that they can be. And so I, I think that you make so many great points there, David, about um, you know, planning ahead and looking at the options. And um, I know that you know, uh, a lot of research can be done online these days, which is great. And, and even asking around, seeing you know, other people, what other people have used in terms of services or um, you know, even the Alzheimer's Association, I know they have a hotline, a 24-7 hotline, and they have a great kind of registry of, of all the types of services out there. Um, so we'll, we'll post the 800 number in the, in the chat and on Facebook just so that people have that. It's a great resource, especially, um, you know, you can even call it two in the morning if you happen to be up at that time. Uh, yes, they're, that's they're right, 24 seven in multiple exactly. languages. The Alzheimer's Association call center has really done an amazing job. Yes, uh, so I think that again, it is important for families to, to plan ahead, to think, um, to have a backup plan, uh, not only during this time of COVID-19, but beyond, it's really, really important. Um, so I know that we have talked a little bit already about engagement during this time and um, it's, we know that engaging an individual living with dementia in activities um, that are, you know, activities that they will enjoy, not just to do an activity for the sake of it, uh, but to really make it meaningful um, can, can be important. But I think more so now than ever, especially as people are spending more time at home, they might not be able to get out as much as they used to be. Um, so any other thoughts or suggestions for family caregivers that you would have, David, on, on how they can engage with their loved one, uh, whether it's in the home or even six feet apart or virtually. Right. Uh, there's a lot of ways people are connecting these days. Well, I think we should definitely talk about six feet apart because, you know, not everybody, you know, you might be a, a son who lives down the street from your dad with dementia and you don't want to necessarily go into the house. So, you know, certainly many people are having to, to work on that. I think there's a lot you can do. I mean, uh, you know, certainly sharing music is certainly very important. I think if you are keeping some distance, you can still do some exercise. You can do chair yoga, have the you know chairs six feet apart. You can, again, have conversation. You can watch a movie. Uh, you, can, you can do lots of different things. Um, one of the things that I, I do want to say is that, you know, some people with dementia may still understand what's happening right now. Hey, dad, you know, um, there's a bug going around and I don't want to give it to you, you know, and, you know, something like that. But one thing I would suggest, you know, when you are working with the person with dementia is perhaps develop a family script. So not everybody's saying the same thing. Uh, some people with dementia may understand, like I say, everything going on, but most probably don't. So you don't want to go into elaborate detail. But in terms of activities, you know, again, anything you can do in, in normal times, I think probably a lot of them can be adapted for, uh, for the situation. So for example, one caregiver I know uh, is, is uh, doing a, a daily reading with her mom over, over uh, you know, uh, Zoom or one of the platforms, you know, where they're, they're doing Skype or FaceTime and she's reading to her mother. 
uh, reading her favorite poems, things like that. So I, I think I think through social media, through the internet, we can certainly ask any building to set up a daily or even twice daily, hopefully contact with the person, whatever whatever they're willing to do. And I would just you know go with your family member and say, hey, uh, let's let's help me out. Let's do a project together. One of my friends, uh, she's cleaning out her wardrobe, so she holds things up for her mother and says, keep or toss. <laughs> <You know? laughs> More do is that, you know, when you ask somebody their opinion, it means you value them. So certainly try your best to, to be engaged. Uh, maybe, uh, again, if you're outside, you can even do some gardening together, just be standing, you know, far, farther apart. Um, but keep that connection going the best you can. Those are some great suggestions. I, I think it's so neat to see on social media, a lot of people are posting the unique ways that they're engaging with their loved ones six feet apart. Um, but we, I like those suggestions that, that you offered up, uh, David, and at technology right now is huge. And I know that there's so many apps and things out there to keep people connected, but I did come across an article um, in the Daily Wireless, and we'll post the link. It was apps for people living with dementia and their mm -hmm. family caregivers. So that might be uh, a nice article to check out. It was great, they had different categories. So some were entertainment type apps, some were cognitive stimulation, some were for the caregiver for communication. Um, I know my family, we, uh, my grandparents have both grand pads. Um, they don't have dementia, um, but it's a way we're all communicating as a family because we each have our own app on our phones and then we, post pictures and we can FaceTime our grandparent on the tablet. So there's lots of ways that families are getting super creative right now. So it's fun to see. I've seen a lot of also um, drive by um, with signs and playing music in the car <laughs> so they can at yes. least see each other. So uh, again, I think it's really helping people get really creative. Um, and again, there's a lot of technology out there uh, that can support that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think as, as we um, go through this time, David, we, we know that family caregivers in general before COVID-19 um, really kind of put their own needs on the back burner. And, and we know that mm. caregiver self-care is really important. So I do want to touch on that today. And um, I know self-care looks different for everyone, um, but you know that respite, even if it's not uh, being able to leave the house right now, but taking little... Uh, chunks of time to renew or to take a break is really important. So um, any thoughts or tips for family caregivers sure. right now, David? And I know caregivers are likely feeling elevated stress. Um, oh, yes. So anything that you can suggest for caregivers to kind of de-stress, uh, recalibrate, mm -hmm. I think that caregivers would find that helpful right now. Well, let me, let me pause for a moment too, Lakeland, and, and, and just kind of carve out an important category of, of our staff, you know, today working particularly in residential yes. care, many of the home and stead caregivers, I'm sure watching uh, activity staff, you know, healthcare folks, thank you for everything you're doing. And, and certainly this is a great time to, you know, work on self-care. And, you know, some of the things that I think are still powerful are, you know, to be outside for a little bit every day, to, to do some good breathing and kind of meditation, you know, things like that, that are, that are really, we know, um, are great for lowering stress. And maybe you've never meditated before in your life, but really what that can mean is just sitting in the garden for five minutes and just, you know, doing some breathing and relaxing and maybe thinking about about some happy times in your life. So I, I think doing your best to exercise, eat well, take care of yourself, I think is very, very good. Um, in terms of caregivers broadly, uh, you know, a couple of things I've been hearing which are really interesting is a lot of people are using this time to call old friends. Mm -hmm. And I've actually started doing that. I spoke to a friend of mine in Kansas the other day who I haven't spoken to for two years. And it was like we, it was like we, you know, we're catching up like we'd seen each other last week. And some long cousins I haven't spoken to for years. So I think even doing some family phone calls can be very therapeutic and help you feel connected and not lonely. I think in terms of self-care, you know, laughter, I think humor, you know, trying to do your best to, you know, watch some of these silly internet videos going around or put on a comedy uh, on television, you know, a rerun of your old favorite show or something like that. I notice, and, and maybe it's my own uh, stress, you know, talking to so many people, but I feel like when I'm watching something funny, I'm laughing harder today than I normally yeah. do. <laughs> yes. It knocks me into a, into a frenzy of laughter. 
Uh, and I think it's because, because I need it. You know, I need, I need the laughter right now. I think we all do. So things like that, I think, can be very positive. And, and you know, in terms of the relationship, I, I don't want to um, be Pollyanna. I mean, I meet caregivers who've had a very wonderful relationship with their family, my, their parents. I'm an only child. I was very close to my mother and father. My mother died with Alzheimer's. And, you know, it was really an honor and a pleasure to be with them even during their disability. But sometimes people have had, you know, really tough relationships with their mother or father or siblings. Um, so, you know, without sounding too uh, preachy about this, you know, maybe this is a time also to think about forgiveness, think about uh, appreciation and gratitude and do your best to maybe turn a leaf on some of the things that have happened. I mean, after all, we're, we're living in a very scary time. Any one of us could get COVID and I suppose any one of us could have some very poor results. So maybe it's a time now to think about this big picture and to express this appreciation. And so when my mom was still alive, you know, I used to love to say to her, you know, mom, you know, I love you. I, what would I do without you? You know, you're such a good mom. And I so, you know, I can't believe you speak three languages and, you know, and, and, you know, just really this affirmations about what is positive in your life and relationships. And I think this can be very, very powerful. I'll take one more minute on this theme and say, you know, um, it's, it's fascinating to me having worked in this field so long, I've met so many caregivers, Lakeland, who are the best caregivers. And I say, oh my gosh, what an incredible, you know, son you are. And, you know, how amazing your dad must have been only to have the son tell me I ran away from home when I was 17. I didn't like my dad, but, you know, dementia struck. And guess what? I, you know, I, I stepped up and, and, you know, I've had, uh, I've had sons say to me, you know, my dad with his dementia, he's forgotten a lot of the bad times, maybe now it's time that I do as well. So again, this idea of healing, gratitude, appreciation, trying to kind of, you know, think about things a bit differently with, with this crisis around us, maybe it's a time to, to, to work on that with your family. Absolutely. So forgive my little meditation there, but I guess we're all being a bit more uh, uh, thoughtful about these things these days. Yes, David, I think that you bring up so many great points there, and, and I think it is um, you know, with everything that's happening, you know, focusing on some positivity or gratitude um, can really help kind of uplift our spirits. And, and um, I think that, you know, reflecting back and, and as a family caregiver, um, you know, we might be kind of cut off from our support system at this time, mm -hmm. but it might, it might be a good time to reflect on that support system. And, you know, after this is all over, maybe I will take up um, my sister's offer to help chip in and, and think about ways that people can support you or the things that you're missing. And maybe you have a, a new level of gratitude for those types of services or supports in your mm -hmm. life. So I think that that's such a great point, David. And uh, I mean, we could talk for ages about <laughs> this. I know you and I, uh, we, we love uh -huh. to talk about dementia care and family caregiving and care partners and uh, they play such an important role and and all i i love that you made a shout out to uh the work the professionals out in the field whether mm -hmm. you're an in-home caregiver or working in a facility setting or healthcare worker uh, we just appreciate all that you're doing because we know that this is mm -hmm. a stressful time for everyone and and the care that they're providing is so so important mm -hmm. uh, but i do want to get to some questions um and we have a lot coming in so uh, if you're okay with it david i'm just going to start We'll start the lightning round here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we'll try to get okay. to as many of them as we can. Um, so to get us started, um, we have Maureen Roden, and she, uh, I'm going to kind of paraphrase just a little bit. Uh, it sounds like she is having, um, her mom is experiencing what uh, some people refer to as sundowning, but uh, I know that term in the field is some people still use it, some people don't, but it sounds like in the evening, um, she's getting upset. Um, she's swearing a lot, which is something that she never did before. Uh, and it sounds like maybe her mom is living with her temporarily through all of this. Um, and so any thoughts or suggestions for um, that evening time when sure. uh, sometimes a person with dementia might experience elevated anxiety or other types of dementia related behaviors? Well, thank you, Maureen. Um, a couple quick things real fast. I think there are some good online resources if you Google sundowning and, and dementia. Uh, most of us these days kind of think that it really reflects the fact that, you know, when you have dementia, it, it, it's, it's an exhausting day. You know, you, you're trying to navigate your world and trying to figure things out. And I think some of it is just pure fatigue. 
that, that your, your family member is just getting tired toward the end of the day. Um, but if you notice that every day around three to five, you know, really the agitation is stirring up, I think again, um, create some rituals for yourself, you know, have a little herbal tea, afternoon tea party, uh, have an ice cream cone. Uh, when you're holding an ice cream cone, you know, it, it, it kind of gets your attention and an ice cream cone evokes memories of childhood. Um, you know, consider a certain snack or, you know, time with pet therapy, you know, with an animal or doing a little project together. All of those things can sometimes help kind of take the edge off late in the day. I will say that, you know, if you're at home, take a look at your lighting because sometimes in the lights, even though now the days are getting longer, you know, make sure that there's good natural light if possible or the lights are all on. Declutter the house a bit if you can. It would be a good time to, you know, unclutter your house because a person with dementia has often has visual spatial issues. And if there's a lot of stuff around, they may be seeing things or having uh, some hallucination if, if they have Lewy body dementia. So I'd say simplify the environment, add some richness, add some rituals. And of course, maybe, maybe see if your mom might want to take a little afternoon nap beforehand because a lot of it can be fatigue. None of us are good when we're tired. And when you have dementia, it, it, it's particularly hard for someone to, to function during that time. I think those are some great suggestions, David. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the lighting. That's what kind of came to mind for me uh, right away, but also um, those activities and engaging them during that time hopefully can help. Um, so thank you so much for those suggestions. I'm, forgive me, I'm trying to kind of field the questions as we go, uh, but um, on Facebook, uh, Sabine is asking, um, or Sabine, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, um, but she's asking, you know, as a caregiver, I'm wanting to wear a mask and gloves to, you know, um, keep the individual as safe as possible for the spread of germs, but um, I feel like it might make the person living with dementia scared or upset. So any yeah. thoughts there? I'm sure a lot of people are having a similar question. Yeah. Well, uh, one, one best practice I've seen, like let's say I have a mask on or, you know, whatever, uh, the gown, that maybe you stand six feet back and you take them off for a moment to introduce yourself and smile and make a little mini connection verbally and visually before you go in much closer to provide the personal care, for example. Um, I think continue to introduce yourself. And I think having a little self-deprecating humor Good grief, mother. You know, there's this bug going around and the doctor wants me to wear this silly mask. Isn't this just crazy? You know, what, what a world we live in. I think someone's having that kind of light, light touch. They, they will read your emotion versus focusing on it. But it, it isn't necessarily easy. And certainly there are people who are very forgetful who, who might become alarmed with the mask. But do your best. I think, again, six feet back, take it off, introduce yourself, put it back on as you get closer. I think those are all be good, good tips. Thank you, David. Um, so another question coming in, um, how can we help those with dementia understand social distancing? I know we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but any yeah. other thoughts for Lisa? She's uh, asking questions. question. It's, you know, this is not an easy one because, you know, you've met one person with dementia, you've met one person with dementia, everybody's different. Um, some people might very easily be able to understand. Others are so forgetful, they, they won't or they just can't understand. Uh, after all, they they want to be touched sometimes. They want to be hugged, all of that. So, you know, I guess a couple thoughts I have, particularly if you're in an institution, maybe try to, you know, even physically arrange the layout of, of the building. So if someone is COVID positive or, you know, ill, maybe maybe you move their room to the end of the hall and try to kind of maybe, you know, not, not lock them in with furniture, but try to at least sort of set things up so that visually they're more in contained space. I think just reassurance, developing a little script, you know, hey mom, um, and again, I, I, I'm sort of, you know, you will adopt your own language, but you don't want to say now mother, the CDC recommends that, because that, 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 that's going to not necessarily work for somebody with dementia, but you might even just kind of keep it simple, mom, you know, I'm afraid I might have a little flu or bug, you know, or I might have that, and so I'm just going to make sure that I don't give it to you, so hey, we, we won't give a hug today, but later. And let's keep a little distance and, you know, maybe use your hands and kind of demonstrate this. I think those would be some techniques I'd, I'd recommend, but it is very tough. Uh, and uh, in some cases, I'm sure very, very, very uh, difficult to pull off. I agree, David. I've heard, um, you know, if you're living within the same household as someone and you're wanting to maintain a little social distance, kind of designating, I think you, you use the kind of um, 
example of a, a facility setting designating mm -hmm. a room uh, but you can do the same kind of thing i think in the house maybe designating sure. Um, if you have multiple bathrooms, you know, one family member uses one bathroom, the other family uses the right. other and mm -hmm. kind of designate, you know, various areas of the home. Um, mm -hmm. And I know it might be challenging to for an individual living with dementia to remember that. But as the family caregiver, um, if you're suggesting using the restroom, you could you know, suggest they go to this one every time. So there are a way, a few ways you can do that even within the home. Yes. Bed. Yeah. Um, David, another question that came in um, was around. I know we, we talked about um, having a loved one in a facility setting, memory care or assisted living or a skilled nursing facility. And I know family caregivers are really struggling, family care partners are struggling, not being able to visit their loved one. And, and some facilities are being so strict that you can't even send in a, a boom box for your mom or you can't make contact. Any other thoughts or suggestions? Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned a few, but I know Anita was yeah. asking. Well, it, it is tough. My, my mother-in-law is actually in assisted living memory care in, in Sacramento right now, and we haven't seen her for, you know, three, three, four weeks almost. Um, so, you know, I, I would um, certainly ask the facility once again to, you know, make any opportunity available for social media or, you know, Zoom calls or FaceTime, but we know that may or may not work for a person with dementia. I think uh, an old-fashioned phone call, you know, sometimes they can hold up a phone. You can say a few things to them that way. That can be positive. Um, a lot of uh, buildings I know are allowing you, maybe mother loves uh, matzo ball soup, uh, you know, it's pass every yesterday, or, uh, uh, you know, you can make your mom's favorite meatloaf recipe, drop it off. Some buildings are allowing people to drop off treats like that as well, or some homemade food. Um, work with the building, do your best. I, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking, and I, I do really worry about people um, having so much time away from their family member. Um, it's stressful on all of us as caregivers, too. but. Again, you know, I'm such an optimist that we will get through this. Um, this may be an unusual thought. We can almost do a whole seminar on it. But Lakeland, you know, sometimes people with dementia are more resilient than we give them credit for uh, yeah. at the moment. Um, they may not remember that it's been three weeks since you visited, three days or three hours. So, you know, sometimes we're just, you know, anxious and, and stressed. And hopefully if they're in a good setting, the staff are lively and loving and you know, they may get through this just fine. I think that's uh, some great thoughts there, David. And um, it is a really hard time. And, and I know that I've, <clears throat> I've also talked to many family caregivers who are in similar situations. And, and in some facilities, um, home and stead caregivers are deemed essential care providers. And so they're still able to go into the facility. And so we've heard some beautiful stories of the caregiver helping the individual with FaceTiming, but we know that that's not a reality for, for everyone and a possibility for everyone. So I think you make a great point of trying to connect with the staff. I know staff, they're doing the best they can. And, and um, we did have a question that came, uh, came in. Um, you know, a lot of um, places are maybe understaffed right now. And so, um, mm. or they're having staffing issues and, and that can put a lot of stress and strain on everyone too. So our hearts go out to all of the direct care staff wherever you're working because we know that this is a, a challenging time for everyone. Um, a few more questions are coming in, well, more than a few. I'm trying to, to um, find the best way to get to as many of them as we can. Um, so do we, um, let's see. I apologize, David. Let's see, we're trying to get, get one here. Okay, how can I find online sessions to engage my mom in conversation or music? Anything that takes the, the focus away from, you know, being cooped up at home. Uh, Aruna is, uh, is asking that on Facebook. So do you have any thoughts? I know you mentioned YouTube earlier. I think there's a lot of great resources out there on YouTube, David. Right. Um, and Lakeland, you mentioned a, a product that I think we, we all like called GrandPad, sort of a dedicated iPad, certainly a regular iPad. You know, it's amazing what's out there. And um, I think Lakeland, you referenced it as well, but many cultural institutions are doing free uh, concerts, uh, symphonies, uh, plays, um, you know, I, I think anything you can do to, again, schedule that kind of as part of your day would be very, very therapeutic. And, and you could even say, you know, Mother, um, how about we go to an evening concert tonight? Mm -hmm. I have two tickets. <laughs> and, and, you know, maybe it's a seven o'clock, you know, met 
opera or the three o'clock uh, whatever, uh, you know, and just have some fun. And, and again, tie it back to your mom or dad or your family member's interests. You know, if, if your mother always loved dogs, I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing like maybe the Westminster Kennel Show is on YouTube or online or, you know, it, you know, my mother, my mother was Canadian and she, she lived in France and, you know, she loved to watch French music. And so, you know, um, I, I think there's incredible things out there. Maybe your, your dad grew up in Hawaii. Gosh, you know, all the scenes of Hawaii beaches and music and Polynesian culture and Hawaiian culture. So I, I think that's a terrific thing. I, I, I kind, I'm kind of saying make a big deal of it as a night at the theater and, uh, you know, serve some refreshments and, Maybe maybe print up an invitation for your family member to hand them, you know, and I have two tickets and print up the tickets and, and have a bit of playfulness about it. I think that can be very good. Yeah, I've seen people do some similar concept with creating a restaurant environment in their, their kitchen ah. or their dining room. Uh, and you go as far as, um, you know, printing a menu and, and lighting candles and kind of making it a fun experience and dress up out of, out of your sweats and into maybe a sports coat and a sundress or something just to kind of make it fun and make it more of an event. Uh, like you said, David, that's, you know, we're all having to get creative. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think those are some fun ways to, to mm -hmm. spice things up a little bit. Um, David, kind of on the other side of that question, Jody's ask, asking, you know, her dad has no hobbies, doesn't seem to be interested in anything at all, he can't get around very well, and the family is really struggling with how to communicate with him, how to talk with him. Um, it looks like her mom's the primary caregiver, so she didn't say if she's, she's at the home or not with them, but um, any thoughts for families sure. who maybe feel like their loved one is mm -hmm. having trouble engaging them? Well, certainly we know that apathy can be one symptom of dementia. I, I would, you know, I always want to look for medical issues. If your father had always been a bit more engaged in life, you might check for depression with your family doctor if you assign depression. But no doubt there are people who kind of begin to lose interest in, in certain things. So a couple, a couple of things I, I like. I think one is to say, you know, hey, dad, I need some exercise. Would you help me toss this ball? Or, dad, I, I, I really need to, you know, listen to this uh, class uh, that I hear is so good. Or may, maybe you're a faith-based family and you want to, you know, watch uh, mass on Easter Sunday uh, if you're, you know, of the, of the Catholic faith or Christian. And you say, dad, I think I need a little religion right now. Would you join me? You know, so when you say, would you do it with me versus you should do this, that can be one finesse to go from no to yes. Um, I think a couple other things is, you know, particularly if someone is later stage, pet therapy, you know, the cat in the lap, the dog, simple chores, brushing the dog, organizing. You know, if you have some old poker chips, pull them out. Ask, say, Dad, look, they've all spilled. Would you, would you help me put the poker chips back by color? Um, again, time outside. Sometimes with dementia care and in life, doing nothing is doing something. Uh, in my books that I've written on the best friends approach, I think it's even on my website, completely free, but uh, we have a publication we call 30 things to do in 30 seconds or less. And just remember that, you know, even like a one or two minute activity, a compliment, sitting, giving some a little hand massage, uh, just busy with them, showing them, you know, dad, look, I, I, I just got this purple sweater last year for my birthday. Do you like it or should I, is it too much? You know, you know going through things like that. Again, uh, we talked about earlier, wardrobe, cleaning out, wrapping presents, you know, going through catalogs, uh, you know, and, and picking things out for people's birthdays, any kind of task where they're helping can sometimes turn that no into a yes. That's, those are some great tips, David. I think that um, hopefully Jody and her family will, will find them to be helpful. And, and we will post David's website again in the chat and on Facebook so that you can go out and check out the great resources that he has. Um, David, again, is such an expert in this space. And I really wish we could get to all the questions. There's so many more that have come in and, and we really appreciate everyone joining us today. And, and we'll try to respond to as many of those questions offline or off video as we can, because we know that this can be a very challenging time for people. Uh, and there are lots of questions that are probably going unanswered. So we'll do our best to get back to as many of you as we can. Uh, but David, I really want to thank you uh, for joining me today and for sharing. Um, you have offered up so many great resources and thoughts and ideas for families as they go through this time. And, and I'm just so grateful to you for, for your time today. 
Well, thank you, Lakeland. It's always wonderful to work with you and your Homestead family, and uh, you all you all um, really exemplify a lot of heart. Um, one of my all-time favorite quotes about people like you, Lakeland, and all the people at Homestead, and many of you, all of you on the call, but this very renowned researcher, Dr. Tom Kitwood, an early researcher in dementia, said, caregivers are physicians of the human spirit. So I want to thank you all for all the work that you do, Lakeland, and all the people on the call. Oh, I love that quote. Thank you for sharing that, David. What a what a great way to end today's chat. Um, I want to thank you all again for joining us. I mentioned at the start of this chat that it's part of a series called Caregiving Caregiving during COVID-19. On Monday, uh, we will be doing a Q&A session with my colleague, Molly Carpenter, who David also knows well. I will be talking about isolation and loneliness during this time of social distancing. Mm. It's a concern that we've had for the older adult population far before COVID-19 ever happened, uh, but we'll be talking about that on Monday. Uh, and this chat series is every Monday th and Thursday at 2 p.m., so we invite you back uh, to join us for the rest of our series. Um, and um, again, this has been part of... Um, this, this series has been, has been a great way to connect. And if you want to stay connected with us at Home Instead Senior Care and the resources uh, that we have, you can join our email uh, list and you can like us on Facebook and, and keep up to date. But uh, before we let you all go, I just want to, again, thank you for joining us. Thank David for joining us. Uh, and I really just wish all of you health and wellness during this time as you care for yourself and you care for those around you. Uh, we appreciate you uh, and we're here to support you. So please do not hesitate to reach out. With that, I'll say good afternoon to everyone. Take good care of yourself. Bye. Bye.